Hello everyone, this is Aurora with the Central Coast Astronomical Society and I am here with Kent Lawless, one of our astronomers from our club, and we are going to take you on a tour of the night sky with um, that has to do with objects you can see with binoculars and telescopes that are themed with Halloween. <laughs> so this is a special presentation that we put together for you. And what's really cool is it's got a handout of many, many objects, and we're going to be going through the first I think the first 13. Is that right, Kent? Yeah, that's the devil's dozen. Figure it fit for <laughs> Halloween. <laughs> or the deep sky dozen <laughs> that we're going to be going through. And so um, a lot of these objects you will be able to see with binoculars, telescopes. Actually, I think just about all of them. And not all of them are going to be up tonight, uh, meaning October. <laughs> and so these are objects that if you can't see tonight, just put them on your list and uh, for a future date, but it's just something that we thought would be really fun for you to take a look at. Some of the objects are going to be Southern Hemisphere as well, so if you live down in the Southern Hemisphere, you're in luck. We have a few objects for you as well. All right, Kent, you ready to get started? Uh, sure. <laughs> All right. So um, the first thing I wanted to, uh, we wanted to talk about, Kent, do you want to talk a little bit about Mars and what's so great about it now October of 2020? Oh yeah, Mars is having its closest approach. I think it was closest on the sixth, mm -hmm. and it you know it's quite bright. You know, bright it looks brighter than Jupiter's big uh, reddish orange star, kind of spooky star for <laughs> Halloween. You know, it is. and uh, it reaches opposition, I believe, which means it's you know directly between, or actually we're lined up with the sun, the Earth, and then Mars. In a straight line on the uh, 13th, which is another good Halloween number. <laughs> and so Mars, you know, is really a good one for Halloween. Definitely. And it's something that you, you can see even just naked eye. It's going to look really bright. It's actually going to outshine Jupiter right now this first week or two in October. Um, but it's going to be super bright in the eastern sky, and it's going to slowly progress as we as we move on through time. And another thing, if, if you have like a six inch to eight inch telescope, you should be able to see detail if the scene's mm -hmm. good, which would be dark marks or maybe the ice cap. And so those are some of the things you should pick up as long as your scene is decent. Yes, yes, awesome. Okay, so that's gonna be one that you can look at tonight uh, with binoculars, telescopes, as Kent mentioned, or just naked eye. Okay, so the first one of our deep sky objects we're going to take a look at is the Witch Head Nebula. You ready? Okay, so this is the object we're going to be looking for. Let me show you first, before Kent goes to talk about it too much, let me show you first where it is in the Stellarium program. Now, if you've never seen this, this is a planetarium software. You can download it for free from Stellarium. Super easy to use. You just put your zip code in and it adjust what it shows you in the night sky. Now remember, some of these objects like this one, this one's not going to be visible tonight unless, I, even if you stay up really late, is it, is it visible at all? Yeah, yeah, if you, if you get up early in the morning, actually Orion is, is nice and high in the sky about five o'clock in the morning. All right. So it is, you know, it's, we're heading towards winter, so if, if you get up early, you can see Orion up there. You can see Rigel, which is uh, the star that lights up the uh, Witch's Head Nebula. All right. So in order to find this one, you're going to find Orion. And as you can see, Orion is a little bit hard to find. Um, but if you look for those three belt stars and then those sword stars, and then we connect the dots, we're going to see the constellation of Orion. And by his foot, Rigel, this is where we're going to be focusing right in here. So what are we going to see in here, Kent? Okay, Rigel is a blue supergiant, and it's lighting up uh, the uh, reflection nebula, which is the Witch's Head Nebula. And it's in another constellation. It's uh, Eridanus, which means the river. It's a great big, long, long constellation. It goes all the way down towards the... Uh, small Magellanic cloud area of the sky. So it's a really long, <laughs> in fact, you can see it there on the image, how long that uh, Eridanus is. And uh, it's got a, a star at the very end, I think called Arcanar or something like that. 
I'm butchering the pronunciation. No, you got it. You got it. Let's see if I can actually get it here. Yep, you got it. A C H E M A R or N A R. Yeah, it's it's not that far from the uh, you know the small Magellanic cloud, but <laughs> it's way way down south. <laughs> yes, but anyhow, it is. The, the witch's head is interesting because if you have dark skies and it's up nice and high, you may be able to see it in binoculars. It's uh, one of those things where people thought that oh, it's it's in a photo. You'll never be able to see it, but. There's been several instances where people use small, either a small telescope at low, you know, low powers or binoculars. The important thing is having the wide field, mm -hmm. and there's been reports that they've picked it up. And so that's, you know, the one nice thing. There's been some confusion about it. Uh, it's given an NGC number 1909, and for a while they thought it didn't exist because William Herschel... Uh, he messed up the direction. He said it was following Rigel rather than preceding Rigel. And so they were looking on the other side of Rigel to try and find this large, diffuse nebula. And in fact, it's on the other side. <laughs> and uh, so they thought NGC 1909 didn't exist, and they gave it an IC number, which is a later number for the index catalog a uh, 2118 uh, number, but it's pretty well known as the Witch's Head Nebula. And in fact, you can see the uh, APOD image there. It has the same problem William Herschel had. <laughs> they flipped the negative. It should be on the other side. And so left and right are reversed on that, uh, <laughs> that image, but it's still a really nice image and that really nice bright star. That's Rigel there. Uh, it's about... Uh, 900 light years away, and uh, William Herschel discovered it on December 20th, 1786. It's about, uh, oh, let's see, I've got, yeah, it's 2.4 2 degrees up and down or north and south, and about one degree wide east and west. So it's a big object. That's why you need binoculars or a telescope. Uh, at you know a small telescope at low power to give you a really big field, and then you can pull it in. And let's see. Uh, oh, the IC number is from a photograph taken from Max Wolf uh, in 1909. He did a lot of, you know, when they first started attaching telescope or to her cameras to telescope, and got good enough film where they could start taking decent pictures they started finding a lot of nebula, and those ended up in the index catalog or the IC numbers for the uh, new general catalog. Does Got that kind it. of make sense? Or? Yeah. And awesome. So, uh, I've never tried it myself with binoculars. I'm, I'm tempted to do that uh, to see if I can pull it in with my old 750s. Wow. All right. Do you want to go to number two? We have... Yeah, let's go to number two. That's a good scary one. <laughs> you can see the, the two kind of eyes there, the bright white areas. That's the Ghost Head Nebula. And it's in the large Magellanic Cloud, kind of below the Tarantula Nebula. Uh, it's in the constellation of Dorado, the swordfish. And we're talking way, way down south. Uh, the large Magellanic Cloud is closer to the South Pole than the Big Dipper is to the North Pole. So it's it's way down there south. The, you know, Magellanic clouds are wonderful. The large Magellanic cloud, you don't star hop. You nebula and cluster hop to get to where you're going because <laughs> there's so many ne nebulas, open clusters and nebulas piled in that glowing area. Also, that area is naked eye. You can mm -hmm. see it uh, quite well. Uh, not not the ghost head, but the uh, the uh, large Magellanic cloud. In fact, I can see the Tarantula Nebula in the image there, uh, which is that brighter, larger area. And it kind of shines out first when after the sun goes down and it's getting dark. You mm -hmm. can see the old Tarantula Nebula there. But uh, the ghost head is given an NGC number. It's NGC 
2080. It's the emissions nebula. Uh, the Large Magellanic Cloud is about 163,000 light years away. So the Ghost Head Nebula would be about 50 light years across at that distance. Uh, it was discovered by John Herschel on December 23rd. Uh, 1834, and it can be seen in a 12-inch telescope as a bright nebula, so an 8-inch scope would pull it in quite well. Of course, down there, the seasons are reversed, so instead of being in cold weather, John Herschel was in dead summer when he uh, when he found that object. <laughs> awesome. Now, should we go back to the witch and uh, maybe check out her broom? Oh, yeah, yeah, let's go back to the uh, Witch's Broom Nebula. And uh, that's, you know, that's on the western side of the Veil Nebula, which is a supernova remnant in Cygnus. And uh, that one is real easy because there's a nice bright star next to it. Uh, it's called 52 Cygnus. It's a naked eye star around the fourth magnitude. And you can look up and see 52 Cygnus, and the witch's broom runs right past it. So I usually just put my telescope on There you got it. You can see that bright star in the witch's broom area there. It's also given an NGC number. It's NGC 6960. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and that star there, that 52 Cygnus, that's a naked eye star. So... It makes it real easy. You find that star, you just put your telescope on it, and then go up and down, back and forth, to see how much you can see of the uh, the witch's broom. That is a pretty nice image. That may be a Hubble image. I don't know. Yeah. It shows a lot of a lot of filaments, a lot of detail. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it certainly does. Now, originally, when I called up the Bat Nebula, you said it didn't look evil enough. So we actually went back and found a better image of it, didn't we? Yeah, yeah, I found a very evil-looking... Uh, <laughs> this is on the, the other side of the Veiled Nebula. Mm -hmm. This is on the eastern side of the Veiled Nebula. And, uh, yeah, it was such a, uh, a evil-looking bat, you know. You can see its eyes up there and a wide-open mouth ready to bite something. And so, uh, you know, and the nice thing is it's not that far from the witch's broom. And so, you know, maybe the witch is trying to hit the bat with, his, with her broom. <laughs> Who knows? <laughs> but uh, it's, it's given its own NGC number. It's NGC. Uh, Wait, this isn't uh, the bat nebula. I'm showing oh, something. That, that's a planetary nebula you got there. That's not the right one. <laughs> Oh, you know what? You know what, what the problem is, is that for some reason someone called that the Bat mm -hmm. Nebula. Yeah, and that can happen. Yeah. So in Stellarium. So here, let's go back to the veil. Now, I can give you the number for the the part of the bat is six nine nine five. Yeah. This is where we're looking uh, right NBC here. The six nine nine five. Yeah, and that's also called the Network Nebula. And that bigger chunk down towards the bottom there, that's where the bat is. In my 20-inch uh, scope, with a, using the 32-millimeter eyepiece, which is a 2-inch eyepiece with a 2-inch O3 filter screwed into the, the uh, base of the eyepiece, that looks fantastic. There's, I, I call it an egg crate pattern. You can see all these square areas. And, you know, it's fantastic view in the 20-inch. Uh, really pulls in a lot of filaments. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, you can kind of see that rectangle there that's kind of like a wide-open mouth on the bat. <laughs> yeah. Would you use any particular yeah. filter if you were looking through your scope? Uh, uh, pardon, what was that? Would you use any particular filters for this one? O3 would be a, a good filter. filter. Also, UHC would work good. Okay. Uh, it would really enhance the view. Although you can see it uh, in an 8-inch. In fact, some people have uh, seen that section, uh, what they call the network nebula in binoculars. Really? So, yeah, yeah. Some huh. people pulled it in. You know, you got to wait till it gets up nice and high. Got to be in a dark area. And you can pull it in with binoculars, which, wow. again, I've never tried. But uh, 
that's what they say. So that's awesome. Uh, oh, I wanted to mention this applies to the the witch's broom also. Mm -hmm. uh, that supernova remnant's fourteen hundred light years away. So that's that's the distance of it. Uh, you know, uh, was found by uh, John Herschel on September seventh. Uh, 1825, where the witch's broom was found by his father, uh, William Herschel, on sep same same day, September 7th, but in 1784. So that's kind of coincident. He found it like uh, what about uh, 40 years later, 41 years later, uh, on the same date. So that's kind of cool. Wow. That's cool. All right. Um, let's see. I kind of was alluding to the next thing you want to take a look at. Do you want to look at the cat? Let's change gears to oh, a yeah, kitty the cat. Oh, yeah, the cat's paw nebula. Cat's paw nebula. Does it look like a cat's paw? Look at that. It, it's actually missing a toe, but it's close enough. The, uh, the brightest toe there is given an NGC number. Okay. It's NGC 6334. But the whole area is actually, the, the whole paw is RCW-127. And for the life of me, I can't remember what RCW stands for. But it's in Scorpius. It's a faint emissions nebula about 5,500 light years away. Uh, the, uh, the toe, I think, is around magnitude 9. And that whole area is about 40 by uh, 30 minutes, so it's good size. Uh, it was discovered by John Herschel on June 7, 1837. How's there. that? There, I, I can see Scorpius. I can see the stinger, and it's there right it above is. the stinger. There. there so you tell got us it. about this one. Okay, and uh, this is about. You see the stinger there, and you can see where the nebula is. Mm -hmm. Distance-wise, it's about uh, three degrees west and one degree north of the uh, uh, the stinger, and so it's it's over and it's up a bit to uh, to get to the cat's paw there, and so that's some you know something uh, for where to find it. Also, an O3 filter or a UHC filter. Uh, should enhance the cat's paw there, but awesome. it's a relatively dim thing. I mean, if you if you get anything, you're doing pretty good. <laughs> but it's you know it, it's it's had the cat's paw nebula name for a long time because mm. photographically, yeah, it's missing a toe, but it still kind of looks like a paw print. So how about NGC 6543? Okay, yeah, my favorite planetary nebula. Is this your favorite? Nebula. Let's and see if I've got the right Draco. one. And you've got the central area of it there. They blow it. Yeah, they can show the uh, outer envelope see of the cat's eye nebula. So I we're looking in Draco? About, Oh, it's NGC 6543, so that's real easy to remember. It is easy to remember. <laughs> it is. And so this one is going to be in and Draco. It. Yeah, it's, it's above the back of Draco the Dragon. Okay. And so it's, I usually start at, there's a couple, a pair of stars off to the, uh, the left mm -hmm. that I usually start at and then go kind of over the back to try and pick up the pattern to get to the cat's eye there. Yeah, okay. And should we talk about what we would see there with a the telescope? Okay, in a telescope, eight inch uh, at low power, it looks like a green star to me. Some people might see blue, some people might see turquoise. And if you up the power, you can get a little disc now, my 20-inch, it's a whole different story. You can see a nice disc. Uh, the color is a lot brighter. And you can see the central star, which to me looks kind of a yellowish color. And that central star is only, you know, only the size of the Earth. 
So it's enormously bright to cause that whole nebula to fluoresce. Wow. And distance-wise, it's about 3,000 light years away. The central area has a size of roughly about 22 arc seconds by 18 arc seconds. And it was originally, uh, I believe, discovered by William Herschel yeah, on February 15, 1786. So William found it. And the interesting thing, it's really important for astrophysics. It was the first uh, object that William Huggins uh, directed a, uh, a telescope with a spectroscope attached to it. And he saw a single bright line, where normally if you look at a star, you get a continuous spectrum spread out with maybe some dark lines in it. And that told him that it wasn't made of stars, it was made of uh, gas or a you know, low-pressure gas, but it was uh, actually gaseous. And so that kind of, you know, allowed them, gave them a tool that they could tell, is it a gas or is it a bunch of stars clustered together that are extremely long distance away? Mm-hmm. And so this one I really love. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it looks like it wants to eat that little galaxy in front there. It's showing the full... Uh, outer halo around the the central cat's eye that you normally see. Uh, there's actually a little bright area uh, to the uh, the le- or to the right of the central area that's kind of elongated, and that was classified as a galaxy by Barnard years ago. And you can actually, under really good conditions, you can see that with a filter in an eight inch. Now remember, there was a guy that had a 20-inch scope that he put black felt all on the inside, and he was up at Mount Pinos, which is like 8,400 feet up, and he could see all the little flecks of halo around the uh, the central part of the cat's eye, which was really mind-blowing. Wow. And so the, the cat's eye, you know, I look at that, and it looks like some critter that's going to go after that little galaxy there. <laughs> And so that's that's a you know that image was I thought a really good image on uh, that is an image. Now, now, by the way, we did put the dates of the images in this uh, handout for I think for most of them um, where you can actually find that image that we've shown in the handout. So you can look at that yourself on the screen if you like. Okay, yeah, um, always, who's next? It's um, always are nice we... to look at it like that. <laughs> Let's see, you want to go to the Owl Nebula next? Yeah, let's go visit an owl. There's the old owl, and the cool thing in that image is you see the central star there, and there's two patches on either side. And that kind of, uh, I think it's, uh, oh, William Parsons, uh, who was the third Earl of Rose in Scotland. He had the Leviathan of Parsons Town. Uh, he was the guy that gave the name, uh, the Owl Nebula, to that planetary nebula. And it's, yeah, it's just below the bowl of the dipper. And you see it's not far away from the bottom of the bowl. And that one, uh, it was actually discovered by William Herschel on October 18, 1787. And, uh, oh, no, I got it wrong. <laughs> it was, it's a measure object. It's M97. Uh, yes. It was discovered by Perry Merchain on March 24, 1781. And, uh, yeah, Lord Rose was the guy that gave it the nickname the Owl Nebula. It's magnitude 9.8. There's no problem finding it in, a like, a 6-inch telescope. Uh, it, you know, pops in fairly well. If you have an O3 filter or mm-hmm. a UHD filter, it'll really pop out. And so, nice. uh, yeah, that's a nice image there. Okay. And, and the then next, the owl cluster, we'll and he's... The, oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Yeah, the the owl cluster's next in the, you know, the Devil's Dozen line up there. And that's a really nice picture of the owl cluster. You can see it with binoculars. Uh, it really looks nice in a, in a scope because of the stick figure. you got the little wings kind of going up you got a, a long body, you got the two bright eyes. 
It kind of looks like an owl, a stick figure owl to me. <laughs> it's also called NGC 457. It's an open cluster that's in uh, Cassiopeia. And it's magnitude 6.4, so it's fairly bright. It's a, se about 79,000 light years away. Oh, he's upside there down here. We have eyeballs here the and the wings are here. The owl's upside down in that. He's flying <laughs> upside down. And uh, the nice thing about my scope is everything's upside down, so it puts him right side up in my scope. And so that's the one nice thing about having a reflector. And yeah. that one was discovered by William Herschel on October 18, 1787. The uh, the name Owl Cluster was coined by uh, David J. Iker, I guess is how you pronounce his name. Uh, I've got several of his books, and he's current editor of Astronomy Magazine. Wow. And so he's been in the hobby. In fact, he started Deep Sky Monthly Magazine back when he was a kid. His father would help him make the Xerox copies that he'd send off to people that had a subscription. And later on, it, it became uh, Deep Sky Quarterly, which was a glossy, really nice magazine. It ran, I think, about, was it like 40 or 50 issues before uh, the uh, Astronomy Magazine Company decided to kill it off, unfortunately, but... <laughs> Uh, I gathered up all the quarterly ones and also gummed on to any of uh, the monthly ones that I could get my hands on. Mm. And so, mm. uh, yeah, his his uh, his writings are really good. Wow. But anyhow, that's the, I've got, got off on a tangent there, but. Yeah, no, that's okay. Uh, <laughs> that's okay. You know, the, currently he's editor of Astronomy Magazine. The two big magazines that we all get are astronomy magazine and sky and telescope mm -hmm. uh, magazine mm -hmm. and I've got actually I subscribe to both even though there's a lot of duplication uh, they still have individual articles that are really good uh, well that's good to know it's a good resource all right we've and got I guess we about should go on to the yeah the we've got four or five one. left do you want to do some skulls now yeah, yeah, let's go for the okay. uh, Flaming Skull Nebula. Now, if you're using Stellarium, you will not be able to find this one because it's not in the database. But if you put in there 59 SER, 59, um, you will get real close to it, right? <laughs> yeah, it's about a minute away, somewhat real close. It's like uh, right in there. If you want to see how to do this on the program, let me show you. Um, you open up the search window and then you put in a position and so I've got mine set to equatorial and so in here Kent gave me the position information it's 18 hours 24 minutes 58.4 seconds 58.4 seconds that's the right ascension information and then the declination is zero and then 51 minutes and 37 seconds. Let's see if I can do this. 37 seconds. Yeah, that should be uh, plus zero. Yes, it's plus zero. Yes, thank you. <laughs> plus zero, 51 minutes, 37 seconds. Okay. So you can see here's 59 serpents, and here is the, inf the, the position I just put in. Yeah, it's about 52 arc uh, minutes northwest of uh, 59 serpents. Mm -hmm. And I, I have seen that in my 20-inch scope. It's not an easy object, but the uh, the images on the Internet are really cool. Yes, uh, they the are. Let me show nebula. one. How about there? Doesn't that look like a flaming skull? Yeah, that's skull? a good one. I like how the <laughs> flames are going off the head. <laughs> this was taken by a, a professor. Big, there's yeah. one star that makes up the eye. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It looks like he's got an eyeball right there. This was taken from a professor a, from the University of Anchorage. And it's a good size object. It's uh, well, yeah, 375 arc seconds by 302 arc seconds. So that's pretty good size. It mm -hmm. uh, would be about five minutes by five minutes, roughly. And so it's, it's really a good-sized object, but it's faint. 
you know, I pulled it in on the 20 inch, but I don't think I tried on the 8 inch. Mm-hmm. But the uh, the image was really cool there, so. <laughs> yes, it is. I thought that was a good one for Halloween. It is a good Halloween one. So again, it's just it's right here. If you just look, well, here let me back up a little bit. So if you are familiar with Aquila or Scutum or Scutum, um, you're going to be looking right about there. There, Can yeah. You see it? And that's in Serpens, uh, the the eastern part of Serpens. Yeah. Uh, Serpens, uh, what do they say? Yeah, Caudia, which is a snake's tail or the eastern part of the snake. It's, you know, like the only constellation that's broken up into two pieces. Uh, <laughs> Ophiuch is, is holding one part, the uh, the head of the snake or the western part in his in his hands, and then... On the other side of Ophiuchus, you've got the eastern part. So it's the only constellation that's broken up into two chunks. Yeah, let me All see the if rest I can get of them are here. intact. Here's Ophiuchus. Okay. Good. All right, let's go ahead. And what is our next target? Okay, we've got the Skull Nebula, mm -hmm. which is NGC 246. Really interesting planetary nebula. It's in Cetus, the whale, or also it's called the monster. Uh, in my 20-inch, you know, this is good size. It's about, uh, oh, 240 by 210 arc seconds. To me, I can see an envelope with some stars inside. It looks more like a grape than it does the photograph there with this, you know, the actual kind of skull-looking object. Um, it's... Uh, about 1,500 light years away. And in fact, we'll cover this again in our October talk. It's one of the objects that's uh, in the October talk. And mm -hmm. it was, again, discovered by William Herschel uh, on November 27th, 1785. And, uh, you know, NGC 246 is a good number to trace it down with. Um, it's about six degrees north of Beta Ceti, which is actually the the really bright star that you see in Cetus the whale. Oh, and, let's see. Uh, there we go. Yeah, let's see if they go. The Beta Cetus is uh, is uh, maybe that's that bright star it's showing over there. But uh, yeah, I've got about six degrees north, so. This thing isn't aligned straight up and south, or north and south then. But also, you can see those two stars to the, uh, there's one star just over to the left and one star almost above it. Those two stars can be used, they form like an equilateral triangle with 246. These and, two here? Uh, uh, one of them is, is P1 or, or 17 uh, seti. The other one is P2 or 19 seti. So you can use those two stars to uh, center in on equilateral triangle. You know, they're, they are actually aligned horizontally in the sky. So I don't know why they're aligned at an angle, but it's probably how the program's set up. Nice. And uh, you just kind of go straight south below those two stars, 17 and 19, and you'll hit 246. Okay, Does that cool. make sense, Aurora? Yep, that makes absolute sense. That looks great. And then you get to see something not quite as crisp as this picture, but you will see a fuzzy patch. Uh, filter really helps, but oh, I've seen yes. it in my 8-inch. So an 8-inch, you can, you can pull in it. Actually, it looks like a, a kind of like a hazy disc. Uh, with stars embedded in an, in an eight inch. Nice. Now, how about this one? Yeah, the vampire star. Vampire that's star. More, this is one that's not going to be. Uh, well, if you want to search for it in Stellarium, it's not. You can't put in vampire star. You have to put in something else. What was the name of the star you were talking about? Oh, Heinz Crim Crimson Star. It's actually R. Leporis. It's a variable. Uh, star, but Arla Porus might get it for you. 
It's in Lepus, the uh, rabbit. There it is. And uh, it's a long period variable carbon star. It and it's varies a different from color. Look at that. Five point... Oh, pardon? It's a different color. Look at that. Yeah, I can see some color there. It's, it's uh, you know, it gets, it actually gets as, as bright as 5.5. So it, you know, for a little while there, it's naked eye. Then it, you know, drops down as low as 11.7. It takes 432 days on average uh, for it to cycle from brightest to dimmest and back to brightest again. It's about 1,360 light years away. And I think the reason they called it the vampire star on APOD is I've seen it where it looks like a drop of blood on a black sky. I mean, super, super red color. And so it, I'm sure it varies a bit in color over time. But uh, I caught it out there one night. It was just beautiful. It had other guys there, and we were all looking at our Leporis. So mm-hmm. they called it the vampire uh, star. And I noticed the APOD is October 31st for 2018. So definitely a Halloween name that they put on there. <laughs> that's awesome. All right. And, you know, that's up this that's up, you know, if you want to stay up late, you know, uh, the winter constellations are coming up, and the uh, Lepus, the rabbit, is just under Orion. So if Orion gets up nice and high, Lepus will be good underneath it. Right there. Here we go. There you go. There's Orion, and there's the bunny underneath it. Mm-hmm. I always think of the rabbit on... Uh, Oh, uh, what was it? The Holy Grail with Monty Python. Search for the Holy Grail. I don't know if you ever saw that movie or not, but they had a killer attack rabbit in it. I always thought of Lepus as a killer attack rabbit out of Monty Python's Search for the Holy Grail. <laughs> but anyhow, that's, I don't know if you've seen that movie or not, but it is kind of funny. <laughs> Well, let's see. We've got a couple more. Do you want to talk about Algol? Yeah, let's go for Algol. Okay. We, we talked about it, uh, when was it, the uh, September last month? Yes, we did. It's called the Demon Star. Mm-hmm. It was part of the Clash of the Titans. It's usually represented as an eye in uh, a Medusa, the, you know, the head that turns you into stone. And uh, it's all, you know... Being a demon star, I figure that's good enough for Halloween. It's about 93 light years away in Perseus. And this is the first uh, first eclipsing binary star. It was, uh, you know, a very, it's actually the second found variable star, but it's the first eclipsing binary star where you've got one star passing in front of another that's not very bright and it causes the star to dim. Mm-hmm. And uh, it turns out about every 59 hours, uh, Algol dips from magnitude 2.1 down to 3.4 over about five hours, and then returns back up to magnitude uh, 2.1 over the next five hours. And uh, the uh, variability of it was uh, discovered by Germanio Montanari in 1667, and then uh, in 1782, uh, John Goodrick figured out how it was an eclipsing binary causing the change in brightness. And you've got a really good size, it's about three times the size, uh, white-blue star. It's about three times the size of our sun. And then you've got like an orange uh, subgiant star that's also about three times the size but the blue one's about a hundred times brighter, and the orange one's about four times brighter. So wow. when the orange one passes in front of the the blue one, we just happen to be along the line of sight, and uh, it becomes dimmer then. But they're both really good sized stars. And, and so is this something you can see with be- binoculars? Can you see this? Uh, it's actually a naked eye star. Uh, out goes a naked eye star, but they're so close together, they're only like 20% the distance from the sun 
to mercury. So they're extremely close. There's no way you could, you know, split them even with, you know, a Hubble or anything like that. I think they have to use a spectroscope mm. and watch the lines go back, you know, double up and go back and forth. Okay. And so other than recognizing you could, you know, there are some charts that you can get that show the brightness of the stars surrounding it. Mm -hmm. And you can sit down and judge it against the other stars and watch when it does a drop on brightness. And if you're patient, you'd have to stay out over, you know, over five hours to watch it drop to a minimum. But uh, a lot of people that are uh, variable star observers like to do that mm -hmm. uh, sort of thing. And so that's uh, the story about the demon star. Does that all make sense, Aurora? Yeah. Okay, I think I've got, got it graphic. here. Yeah, you've, you've got it there. Yeah. Also, I think, called Beta uh, Persei. All right. Yeah, do you, you want to? There. there you go. Do you want to do the last cluster since we're in Perseus? Yeah, yeah. It turns out that this this uh, this one's called the Perseus uh, cluster. It's actually also uh, the actual bright one in there is called Perseus A. Which, yeah, you're circling it there, and that's the right one. That's NGC twelve seventy five, and it's got problems. It's a, it's, uh, let's see, it's two degrees east and a half a degrees north of Algol. So it's not far from Algol. It's actually fairly close. And uh, Let me just put it in so the program will circle it for us. Okay, go ahead. You oh, keep okay, talking. Okay, cool. Oh. Sorry. Keep talking. Go ahead. Okay, so... Yeah, we got about we go. two degrees east and about a half a degree north, and you have that. That's the that's the kind of like the dominant star in the cluster. The cluster is actually called A Bell 246 for Georgia Bell that taught I think at UCLA as an astronomy professor, and uh, he went looking for clusters of galaxies on the Palomar Sky Survey uh, photos. And he found quite a few of them. But, uh, yeah, there's some interesting, uh, that's that's a nice AOP. Or I guess, guess that's just the image in Stellarium, right? There, there you go. go. You can, you got Algol and you've got the galaxy cluster. Yeah, so we have Algol here <laughs> and this, this is where we're looking now. Though. And if I highlight, you can see how many galaxies there are in here. Oh yeah, there's a whole mess of galaxies in there. <laughs> here's the here's the right. Hubble picture of it. That's probably a Hubble shot. You yeah. Can see there's yeah, there's lots of little ones, little ellipticals. Mm -hmm. You've got those two big monster uh, ellipticals in the center. Yeah. You have little spirals all around the edges, and. Uh, and this is the yeah, one you one. specifically were talking about, right? With this image. Yeah, that one's very interesting. That's, you know, that is hydrogen gas, but it's being held in filaments. And it kind of drove them nuts when they found it because they couldn't figure out what was going on. But what they think nowadays is there is a massive black hole in the center of that 12, NGC 1275 galaxy. And there's a big magnetic field going right out of the, uh, out of the galaxy, and it's trapping this hot hydrogen gas in in filaments. It looks really bizarre. <laughs> Definitely <laughs> Halloween type look uh, there. But uh, yeah, that was driving them crazy there for a while. Um, yeah, definitely a neat looking thing. And uh, that galaxy is also called per se. And there you've got the X-ray. Yeah, the uh, this is centered about on the NGC 1275. And uh, it's really, really hot gas. It's around 50 million degrees. It's, you know, the image is in x-rays because that's what you get out of, you know, extremely hot gas. You get the x-rays pouring out of it. And uh, 
The interesting thing is this really hot gas, there's a lot of mass tied up into it. It's more massive than all those other galaxies we saw in this cluster. Oh, also that cluster is about 230 million light years away. So it's a long, long ways away. Wow. <laughs> but I thought, I thought that was kind of a cool image uh, to uh, end the, uh, the devil's dozen there for Halloween. <laughs> Deep sky dozen. <laughs> I don't want to have nightmares. <laughs> well, thank you, you know, Ken. Maybe we'll... It's just not a good Halloween unless you cause a few nightmares. <laughs> <laughs> well, there's there's actually a lot more in here that we just don't have time to cover. We covered the first 12 or 13, and then there's another of that many again in here for you to look at. You can look them up. Now you know about Stellarium. Um, you can go out there and, and try to find them with your telescope. Again, not all of these are up tonight. So you want to put them on your checklist for doing throughout the year. But these are Halloween themed astronomy because honestly, I really think Gal um, that Halloween needs more like kids dressed up as Galileo and Newton we had to remind us of all the scientific discoveries we've been doing that require being out at night. So this was just something that we both Kent and I wanted and Brian as well. Thank you, Brian, for helping. He's the one who helped create this document. Um, so putting things together as well as Kent and myself. So, um, well, so Kent, did you have any other last closing words you wanted to let everybody know? Just wanted to wish everyone a happy Halloween. <laughs> and Stay yeah, I happy. Like, I, like the, uh, I like the figure Brian put there on the handout. He, he did a good job for, yes. you know, the first cut of the handout. Yes, so, yes, yes. You know, it, it's a good handout. Excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. Happy Halloween from us here at Central Coast Astronomical Society. We hope you have a wonderful Halloween. And now you can share the night skies with your neighbors and their kids and their families. Get people even more excited about the night sky. All right. We will see you soon. Take care, everybody.